Hey, quiet on the set. <laughs> <laughs> combat base. Um, combat base is just a name I gave to the this position as your combat base. And the reason why I am named it that is just because it reminded me in the Marine Corps. You know, this is where I can shoot. This is where I can go guard. I can stand up. It, it's just a very good base. And, and for some reason, when I was instructing as a new black belt, I was up in Oregon at SBG, and I didn't have a name, and I named it a combat base. And the Curies in England liked that name, so they named the first school a combat base a combat base and I just spray painted it on the wall so I really never named it really a combat base has no home base um, there was also big rivalries between uh, you know the, the Sambo guys go core guys the judo guys the jiu-jitsu guys and the wrestlers it was still very separate. Of course, there were some wrestlers cross-training in jiu-jitsu, some judo guys cross-training uh, in jiu-jitsu. Uh, the most famous ones probably being back then the Camarillo brothers, uh, you know, epic judo guys that came in and, and annihilated in uh, uh, jiu-jitsu. Um, and uh, so, you know, because of that, there was still like a lot of, a lot of rivalry. Um, there used to be these uh, tournaments in the early 90s called Submission Wars. I think they were in Bakersfield, California. And you could wear a gi or not wear a gi. And um, it was jujitsu guys, it was judo guys, it was wrestlers, it was catch wrestlers, sambo guys. Uh, you know, it was still, it was a lot more of a free for all back then. And it was um, a lot more entertaining, a lot more exciting. The way that I like to train is 100%. Uh, it is to be as physical as possible. There were guys who played a very defensive way of doing jujitsu. Mine was always. Uh, be as aggressive as possible. The people I, when I saw them, I said, hey, this is what I want to model my style on. It's Leo Vieira, uh, Victor Shalin Heberio, guys who were fluid, who were always moving. Uh, and that's really a young man's game. You can only do that when you're younger, when you have the energy, when all you do is jujitsu. And there was a time when I could do that, when, you know, I had uh, no responsibilities. But I'm a father, I have two children. And I have a wife, and I, uh, you know, I have a job, and uh, I made a decision uh, to leave the jiu-jitsu world uh, so that I could go back to school and get uh, my degree, and then ultimately get uh, um, a uh, law degree and teach and uh, um, uh, be a lawyer, a uh, prosecutor. Uh, I got my degree. Uh, I had a real sense. Uh, Partially because I had a daughter at a very young age that I had a responsibility to provide for her. And I didn't believe that jujitsu, my vision of where jujitsu's future was, I didn't believe that it was going to sustain me as being able to sustain her economically. I knew that I uh, had a greater possibility of economically providing for her by going to uh, uh, school, getting my degrees, and then ultimately becoming a prosecutor. Um, and then as I got older and, you know, the opportunity perhaps to come back and train jiu-jitsu, um, you know, I had that opportunity. I started doing that. But what immediately happened was I started getting injured again. And I realized, uh, look, I'm a professional. What I do is uh, I provide a service to society. I make sure that people who do bad things are taken off the streets so they can't do bad things to good people. And that's important to me. It's my way of giving back to society because I believe I've been given something in, incredible. Uh, and as a consequence, if I want to assume that role, I can't go uh, and do it half-heartedly. I can't come to court uh, in front of a jury and have a black eye or a broken arm because I thought it was fun to go train. Uh, and I also knew that uh, I couldn't sustain the type of the way that I wanted to train. So that when I started training again, after I'd been a prosecutor, I invariably got injured and realized, yeah, this, this isn't going to work. So what I do now is uh, I bicycle. Uh, and I, uh, you know, don't get injured, and it's a lot of fun. And then take my nap, shut the lights off, and just kind of... This, man, I'm telling you, man, sometimes, this sometimes it's better than my bad, you know? <laughs>
and it's just a gift too from my business partner and uh, he understand that we need sometimes just to close the eyes and get ready for more. We owe a lot to the Grace family. That's where everything is start, you know. It's a family that is devoted since they born to the perfection of the art of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, hands down. And I was very fortunate to be able to experience and hear and share the mats with Master Ed Grace and know his values, what he's thinking about, his secret book, about all his beliefs and his way of teaching. And uh, the guy is, is just unbelievable. He's a human being like him, no other. And I'm very proud to have both masters in my wall that I have the opportunity to experience with them and it's just unbelievable. I'm very honored to be able to be part of the history of that. I had um, our registration card back in Westwood had the, num the number of the student and um, Carlson put number one on my card. So just to say that I was his first student in the U.S. and I was very proud of that. These are the ones that really mean a lot more to me. Um, this is a picture in front of the karate studio on Venice Boulevard. Uh, it's uh, Redwood, the man standing next to Carlson, senior. He owned the karate studio and I managed to negotiate to rent a small room from, from him so we can practice jiu-jitsu. And this was after the Westwood Academy. And we were there for several months. And people came, trained with us. We had, here's a picture of when we were, see, you can tell how small the room is. You have Ricardo Laborio. You have Vitor. You have Rodrigo. You have Walid. My friend Yuki Nakai when he came to visit us. After he trained with us, I drove him down to Jomera's Academy and he trained there. And he met Kimo, trained with everybody. It was great times, awesome. Unbelievable experience. Oh yeah, and you know this guy, it's an old friend of mine. Bear from Show Your Roll as a white belt competing. This stuff. I, do, I, I can't remember the special moves. <laughs> <laughs> the thing with Dawson is he has long arms and all that stuff, so it's like. Oh. Oh. I gotta make sure I oh. represent hard because this is on camera. If I lose, <laughs> this is like it's, it's gonna be very embarrassing losing on my home field. Oh, oh, oh. Game over here. Oh, nice. Good B-roll. Good B-roll. <laughs> <laughs> Still, sure still, still, still the champ, hopefully. <laughs> I think it's just, I think it's really just a direction in your head on where you want to go with what you want to do and being at the right place at the right time. You know, I think, I think we were kind of at the right place at the right time. You know, if we came in today with our same model, it might not work. For us, it was never a business. It was never something we really, really, it's more of a hobby. Sure, it was more of a hobby at that time, you know? So yeah. we just kind of did it because I was a geek in jujitsu and. I wanted to put reggae stripes in a gi, you know. <laughs> That's really all it was. And, and as far as vibe and the the way that uh, California and our roots and our upbringing kind of helped the, our brand and the lifestyle of what we represent through jujitsu, I think it's um, I I think it it benefits a lot because uh, we live it. You know, it's not like um, it's not anything we're trying to be or um, something that we're not. It's um, Everything that's expressed through the brand is usually something that's pretty close to us, you know. Um, so, uh, California being kind of the mecca of of, of jiu-jitsu right now, and also we have Hollywood, so that kind of helps, you know. <laughs> but I mean, overall, like the lifestyle in California is pretty laid back, um, and it's also like the islands. I'm from Guam, so it's you, you kind of get that laid back island vibe too, um, and and I think that overall shows a little bit in the brand and. When people meet us and they kind of see what we're about, it's really close to that. And jiu-jitsu itself is pretty laid back, you know. In in Rio, stuff is in Brazil, 
stuff is pretty mellow, you know. Um, Yo, turn the corner on your live, people start your heart. Time for the doc to compose master bars. Come back to life when you love with ours. Chest compressed, red cross, yeah, we G's by far. Now take a breath, hold that like that endo smoke. Come home to hip hop because of flows I wrote. Shock therapy with words, man, I fix schizos. The depressed take vacays, now they play calypsos. Hymic thrust, make them spit up that shit they swallow. Even if they ain't covered, they see in tomorrow. Gurgle it down, down a drain, shake your stress. See the end of the tunnel light? You must confess that when you hear these, you hear MC by far. Give you heart by copter, jet on foot and car. Common man, same attention as that mega star. Listen quick, watch these words will start your heart. Breathe in, breathe out, this is CPR. I got the rhymes off the hook, they'll start your heart. Now run and tell your haters, they won't get far. And tell the dead that these rhymes, they CPR. E Root, Atlantis Rising. Having the class with having classes with Horian was you know he'd teach technique and then we'd um, and then maybe just he'd we'd roll like maybe the last five ten minutes of the class but it's hard to compete with a black belt when you're a blue belt so you know he would each time he would, he knew how to get you know better and better and better first like you're catching him and you kind of go will you let me catch you well of course. I mean, if you see the video of me with Hickson, he makes me look good. You know, I saw one person left a comment on YouTube going, wow, he, he, he tapped Hickson Gracie. You know, I mean, seriously. You know, so, but Hickson, when I was Purple Belt, having classes with him, we'd have a 45 minute private class, 30 minutes of technique, and then nonstop 15 minutes of just like, you know, and I'd be tired and going, okay, stop. And he goes, no, this is when you got to keep going. So he had a, a different mentality because I had already been a purple belt and he wanted me to get better and better and better. But I think now it's probably the same, but with more intensity. I mean, you're having guys now that are, I mean, training twice a day, a couple of, you know, two, three, four hours a day sometimes and, you know, getting their black belts in, you know, record time because of the time that they're putting in. There's good teachers, and then there's great teachers. And that's the mentality that Horian had because when I first learned, you know, I didn't think that, you know, from my own, my own idea of what I was, I didn't think that I could learn. I just said like, what am I doing here? And he said, look, Richard, he said, just come to the class. He said, there's no bad student, there's just bad teachers. So. And he says, and I'm the best. You know, he would tell me he's the best. And I'm like, how do you know you're the best? But I've seen, I've been taught by a lot of guys. And there's something about, he is an incredible teacher because it's the psychology. And I was blessed to have that because along with that too, to pass it on. Um, so I, yeah, submission only. I think it's really cool. I was just at Jeff Glover's Sunday rollout this past Sunday and they did submission only and the average match uh, length was four and a half minutes. Um, and it's cool to see, it's cool to see matches end, end in submission. Uh, when guys aren't worried about points, they open their game up. There's more of a flow. There's more of a roll to it. And that opens up the opportunity for more submissions. And, and it's just way more exciting uh, to watch. Again, that said, I don't know how you could do like a 3,000 competitor a submission only event. Um, but also, you know, maybe if IBJJF wanted to move things to the top level, um, they could just be, you know, when you go to the worlds for judo, there's no white belts there. It's all black belts, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, the idea of being a white belt or blue belt or purple belt world champion is kind of a little bit silly too, right? I, I really think I like, like, submission it's a good of course if you submit it's done you know it's the goal it's the main goal but if you do tournaments that it's submission only it's hard to submit because people don't care about the points but if you care about the points you know if you're not letting people you try not let people score on you you know the the submission shows up so i like the point you know, I like I like the even even the advantage. You know, like <laughs> I I uh, I lost 
you know, a, a bunch of fights for advantages, you know, I think, oh my God, my, especially the, the you know, because I go turtle and I don't know why people, you know, score advantage when I go turtle, you know, but whatever. Uh, but I agree with the advantages, you know, sometimes the, the fight is close and, and whoever, you know, attack more, you know, almost did something, you know, get advantage and then it's fair. And uh, this <laughs> is how I communicate to my uh, employees, you know. If I have a good day, they come here, they look, they know I'm open to talk. If I'm here, we are having a heavy day, there's a lot of things going on. If I st start to drop and raise the other ones, then I start to get a tough day, you know. It's the day that uh, you gotta watch out. If the hand is open, everything is cool. We are open for any kind of conversation. The test is being able to go out and train with other people. If you have access to, whether it's tournaments, whether it's uh, you know UFC or whatever, you are testing it and you're making it grow. If you stay in the same place and you have a small world and it's closed, you'll never know. You're no different than the karate that, uh, that they would uh, criticize back in the days. I think there was a little bit of time before I started uh, training consistently. Um, my father brought me down again and I started training with Hoist and this was before the UFC. Uh, and Hoist was, uh, you know, remarkably different than he is today and how most people know him. Uh, Hoist, before the UFC, was a uh, uh, fun-loving kid, skinny, uh, tall, um, really just happy-go-lucky, uh, not really interested in uh, jiu-jitsu so much as like a, you know, competitive thing to fight people. He just, uh, most of everything they would talk about is how he went out uh, to the, uh, you know, some bars or clubs and tried to hit on some girls the uh, night before and, uh, you know, he had a group of uh, students who would go out and uh, hang out with him and, uh, uh, but he was uh, a carefree guy. When you thought about, you know, really somebody representing jiu-jitsu at the time uh, and being competitive and as a fighter, it was Hicks and Gracie, his older brother. Um, but Hoist was just, there was something as a 16-year-old at the time looking at probably at the time a 24-year-old Hoist that, hey, this guy's just cool and I want to hang out with him. What I said in ver very early on, what I said to uh, Horian's uh, second wife, Suzanne, was, and to anybody who would listen right after I left Jiu-Jitsu, was there will be a gym just like in karate was before Jiu-Jitsu on every corner. They'll be everywhere. I mean, you just think about the math of it. You're going to have, you have Hoist teaching and eventually he's going to have a bunch of black belts. They're not going to stay there. They're going to like doing what he does and they're going to open up their own gym. And that's going to drive the price, price down because you can't possibly have, the market won't sustain that. You can't have this, the, the prices that they were charging were ridiculous. Uh, so you'll have it on every corner. You'll have uh, um, greater access. People will be able to train at different places. They'll leave from one gym and then go train in another. And there'll be more tournaments. People will be competing against each other. And there'll be more access to other things. People will cross train. They'll do kickboxing. They'll do wrestling. And uh, essentially, uh, that, that was what my prediction was. You know, much of life is but being in the right a place at the right a time and having your ears open enough and being open-minded enough to do it. I knew a lot of guys who rejected the a challenge and the well, Gracie challenge you know in some ways it was arrogant but if you look at it you know it is really what began this whole explosion because but jiu-jitsu was not a flashy style. Like even now, most of the time, I would rather watch a football game, a basketball game. It's not a, a, an exciting thing, really, but to watch. Highlights are exciting, your friends in the match it is, but ultimately, it's kind of a boring sport as a spectator. And in the early days, he, like I, I remember I was a, um, but purple belt, I was in the reserves at the time, and I was in the Pensacola, Florida, and I was trying to recruit a students because I was just dying, I was addicted, I wanted a to roll. I would go to the judo club, and I'd beat all the judo guys, 
and they wouldn't think it was anything special. They just thought it was some weird judo thing and they'd pound the mat and let me try again, but they wouldn't want to learn. And the philosophy I've always had is if a person, if they're, they don't want to learn, I'm not going to show them. You know, I'll p p compete against them, but if they don't ask me how it was done, why show them? I mean, as a general approach, I say you think street, you train the sport, and you practice the art. You practice the art because it's a practice. You can never master it. It's a continuing practice. You train in the sport, and that means I have to train my body as an athlete. My body is the vehicle of, of my art. And I think street, but I don't train street. When you train street, you, you almost but devolve into a eye gouging, throat grab, groin striking game. But I always think street. I've never left that. I always imagine, even in a match, I always imagine maybe I'm down two points, an advantage, whatever it is. I imagine right now, if I was on asphalt, would I be losing or winning? That's just how my mind is. And that actually enhances my sport game and keeps my art honest. Because what keeps the art honest is that growth of knowing that, that really the reason why I walked in the room is because I want to learn how to fight. That's how we inspire ourselves. How you call that, Shandy? It's a cassettet. It's a Tahitian uh, weapon, war weapon. This don't mess with this one. This one is heavy. It's shiny too. Yeah, I got invited to go to Tahiti for called an Inved uh, Nogi tournament. Also, I got to fight, fight uh, Clark Grace in the final. This is all hand craved. Uh, actually, the guy that uh, the only the tattoo studio that I tattoo that. He, uh, he's the one that engraved this. So it's a war weapon, you know? That's how the guys used to fight back in the day. Awesome. Uh, and it was funny because I came in the airport and the guys like, the guy said, what is this? I'm like, it's a cassette. And they're like, <laughs> they really didn't know what to, what to say, you know? I would go to the, to the freaking <laughs> airplane and try to kill somebody, but that didn't happen. So it was pretty cool. And then after the show, I got to watch Chupo, the, the big wave contest and, uh, you know, hang out and get to meet everybody, good people. So those are my two two babies right there. So don't mess with me either. Bust your school open, I can chop your head. <laughs> <laughs> it's freaking. I've never, I've never really thought of it. Yeah, you know? like I know why, but I never like. What was the question again? <laughs> no, it's no, like the so most basic sure, question. Yeah. No, <laughs> why do you train jiu-jitsu? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I think the the reason why I enjoy training jiu-jitsu, and I think probably. I know 80 percent of people like training jiu-jitsu it's probably like the most it's like a drug right so it's it's probably the most addictive thing you can do because it it it, it even it, it consistently evens out your ego you know as long as people understand like jiu-jitsu is a it's a lifelong term process it's a lifestyle and they don't take it so much as hey i have to be this good you know um i think that's a, it it just helps them overall you know it could be it could take you six years to get your black belt it could take you 25 years, you know, um, but the goal is just to never stop, you know.